Hi, I'm Joseph Berardo. At MagnaCare, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the health care issues that affect their lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by United Water. Making the planet sustainable is the best job on Earth. The New Jersey Education Association. Wells Fargo. Berkeley College. MagnaCare. University Hospital, Newark, New Jersey, and by Fedway Associates. Promotional support provided by NJ.com. Small news, big news, true Jersey. And by NJ Biz. All business, all New Jersey. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. We want to welcome for the first time Roy Steinberg, who is the producing artistic director of the beautiful Cape May stage in... Cape May, New Jersey. Have you ever been to Cape May? Uh, no, but it's all the way down. The so as far <laughs> south as you can go is exit zero. You can't what's go any further what's south. What's the history of this place, by the way? Well, Cape May Stage has been in existence for over 25 years. I've been there for seven. And the th most people are shocked to find that there is a world-class theater in southern New Jersey. I mean, I, by world-class, I mean we have Tony Award-winning actors and actresses in Pulitzer Prize-winning plays. And it's, I'm kind of shocked myself that we get these amazing people to come How here. How do you get them? Well, three, three reasons usually. Sometimes, I mean, I'm an old guy. I've been around a lot, so I know a number of people. I've worked in Los Angeles. I've worked in New York. So sometimes they're friends of mine. Also, I sometimes will get someone who won a Tony Award for doing a musical, but they really want to do a drama. And I can feel whether they have the chops to do that or not. So I'll bring in a Tony Award winner to do a, a drama, a part they really want to play. And the third reason is Cape May. I mean, Cape May is a beautifully glorious it's gorgeous, place. Isn't it? Yeah. The other thing that I find fascinating is that uh, our longtime producer, Georgette Timoney, who works with you guys down there, is part of a play that you have now called Red Hot Patriot, uh, the kick-ass wit of Molly Ivins. Yes, well, you know, Molly Ivins was this journalist in Texas. And it's so current because, you know, at the time she was writing, she was writing about George W. Bush and, her, and his father. She, did they grow up together? Uh, yeah, Ivans, Ivans and George Bush yeah, they did. Knew yeah, each other they knew each other, right? yeah, absolutely. And Molly had a column that syndicated in hundreds of hundreds papers. of papers, including the New York Times. Yeah. And yeah. she was very, very funny. I mean, whether she, you know, whatever your political persuasion is, she was kind of an equal opportunity. What did she offender. call George Bush? Shrub. Uh, she called him Shrub. <laughs> because a shrub. She, yeah, because he wasn't a Bush. He was just a shrub. Oh, okay, I in got her it. Mind. I got it. But Georgette Riley Timoney is so charming and funny, and uh, energetic, that she has this ability to just win an audience over. And it's just a delightful evening. Well, let me ask you, that is part of this particular play is part of an uh, all-female playwright season. Yeah. What's the deal with that? Well, you know, the deal is that 70% of our patrons happen to be women, but only 20% of the plays produced across the, across the country are women. And this is part of a national trend from Los Angeles to DC to New York. And so we decided to kind of put our money where our mouth is and do a whole season of female playwrights. It just so happens that the last few years, the Pulitzer Prize winning playwrights, last year it was Annie Baker won the Pulitzer Prize for Flick, uh, Tony Award winners have all been women, and yet few plays that are produced are written by women. So I looked around to see plays that interested me. And I thought, as a guy, what's, what's a play that would interest me that happens to be written by a woman? When I found the first one, uh, the, um, the Red Hot Patriot, I just was ex exhilarated to be able to produce that. And where'd you find these other playwrights? Well, Mary Mary is the next one we're doing, which was the biggest hit in the 1960s. It ran longer than any comedy on Broadway, written by Jean Kerr, who was Walter Kerr's wife. Walter Kerr was a, the critic for the New York Times back then. And it's just, again, a very funny play, the kind of play you can roll off the beach and not have to think about too much and just have fun. And then we're doing a play called uh, The Search for Intelligent Life in the Universe by Jane Wagner 
and Lily Tomlin won the Tony Award for that. So it's a one-person play playing many, many characters. Very funny, but at the same time has lots of wisdom in it. Let me ask you this. We'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the Red Hot Patriot in a second. Um, you have this artistic side. You have this creative side. Yes. You know what it is in a play that you're looking for. But you're also running a business. How do you match those two up? Well, it's right side, left side of the brain. I mean, I was a producer for many years. Mm -hmm. I did daytime television. I was a producer of Days of Our Lives and Guiding Light and One Life to Live for a little while, a director as well. Um, so I understand budgets and I understand managing people. Uh, but you're right. I mean, my, my focus is on the creative side. So I know how to tell a story. Basically, I think of myself as a storyteller. That's your first love. That's my first love, yeah. Now talk about the part of marketing, branding, putting fannies in the seats, paying the bills. Yeah. You love that or you just have to do it? Well, it's a piece, I, I wouldn't say it's my first love, but it's a piece of what I, I want to share my first love. Meaning, I'm, are you meaning, saying you can't do your first love unless you do right. the other thing? Exactly. It's sort of like public television. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah you're right. <laughs> You've been there. Uh, no, we live there. <laughs> you live there, right. Yes, I mean, absolutely. I think part of what we do is in theater is to share the work, you know, to share the story. If there's no audience, right. there's, there's, there's no one to receive our mm -hmm. message. And so... Uh, it's important to me that we get our brand out there, that people understand mm. what Cape May Stage is. And so we have a website, capemaystage.org, that gets, lets people know what we're doing. And, and this year we're doing all kinds of new things. So we're continuing. What are you doing with kids? Uh, yeah, we're education. doing a whole kids program that PNC is underwriting so we can make tickets very affordable. So, for example, if we have a puppet show, not only will the children learn uh, how to make a puppet and how to manipulate a puppet, but then they'll see an Emmy Award winning puppeteer actually perform the puppet show. Same thing with mm -hmm. the magic show. Same thing with stage fighting. We have a guy who was on Broadway doing vaudeville. Um, so, and again, he'll be working with children in a workshop in the morning and then performing at night. Mm -hmm. So they get a chance to really see what artists mm -hmm. do. You talked about some of the other plays you're, you have coming up, but go back to the Molly Ivins yeah. play. What is it about Molly uh, and Georgette's playing Right. That role, right? That's correct, yeah. Molly Ivins was terrific and interesting because? Well, because she really saw the truth and she could skewer people in a, uh, in a way that was, uh, that was incisive. As a writer? As a writer, Did yeah. she care what anyone thought of her? I don't think so. <laughs> I think, you know, she grew up in a very conservative household. Yeah, and, in uh, Texas. In Texas, right. And she, I mean, just for example, one of the things she said about one Texas politician was that if he were any dumber, any dumber, we'd have to water him twice a day, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of witch she had. She did not care. No. She did not care to be popular. Uh, well, I think she was popular, and I think that the reason she was so popular is because, like people we have today, I mean, we have, we have women journalists now. Molly, um, Molly Ivins is probably the, the trailblazer in some ways for people like Maureen Dowd and Gail Collins and... And that's us on the left, but on the right, we have you know other people as, as well. It's interesting. Yeah, Georgette, our good longtime producer here in public television with the Caucus Educational Corporation. Well, the reason she's so great is that she's so charming. You know, the second she walked in, I didn't know her. I must say, when she walked into the audition, uh, I was immediately taken. I'm not the director of this play. Marlene Lustig is the director of this play, and she was immediately taken by her. And then we called her back, and she read some more. And the more we talked with her, she, because she's a producer and she's so smart, mm. you know, that she combines her in intellect with her creative side and mm. comes up with this great Texas accent. And she's just a, a charming presence to be, to be with. Oh, she's a great producer as well. Real quick, one more time, some of the other plays this season are? Uh, Dead Man's Cell Phone by Sarah Rule. Guys in a, in a coffee shop, cell phone goes off. Woman comes up and says, sir, turn your cell phone off. And the guy's dead. And she says, hey, he can't talk right now because he's dead. <laughs> and she takes the call and says, uh, can he call you back? You know? And she ends up getting involved with this whole family. And then we're doing a play about a judge, Judge Francis Biddle from Philadelphia, uh, with, again, with Austin Pendleton, who just won the, the uh, Pulitzer Prize winning, he just directed the Pulitzer Prize winning play this year. And finally, we end up with a world premiere of a play called Cape May Christmas, which is Santa Claus in Cape May, wow. being written specifically for Cape May Stage. Good stuff uh, at the Cape May Stage, Roy Steinberg, the producing artistic director. Wish you nothing but the best down there. Thank you, Steve. And we uh, thank our longtime producer, Georgette uh, Timoney, who brought us to you and you to us. Thanks so much. Pleasure. Good stuff. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. That was great. Thank you.
To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. It's my honor to uh, welcome Ann McCormick, who is a chemistry teacher at Jackson Memorial High School in Jackson Township. Um, 21 years you've been teaching. That is right. Former accountant. I am. And then you switched over. How many years of counting? Um, oh, uh, three, uh, maybe four before my children were born, and then I went back to school to get my chemistry degree. So it was a process from the time that I became a mother till I became a chemistry teacher. Well, our partners at the New Jersey Education Association feature great educators in their classroom close-up series, and that is why we're about to introduce folks to uh, this video that tells your story, and then we come back, we'll talk about it. Can we do that? Sure. Have you seen this before? I have seen it, yes. Well, I have not, oh, and I'm going to okay. join everyone else in appreciating this right now. Classroom close-up. Let's check it out. So the computer scientists are doing one thing, and the doctors are going, that's not exactly what we need. You are here so that you can do both. You're here so that you not only can talk the science, but you can also talk the computer talk. Everybody knows, especially in the technology area, exponentially technology is growing. It's, for someone my age, it's almost impossible to keep up. We, science knows that, and science is bringing technology into every single thing they do. The scientist that doesn't know how to use technology isn't being very successful today. And we see this as an opportunity to contribute to the world, but also to change the lives of our students. It's not just a new idea for us, but it's a new idea in industry as well, that we're gonna start bringing these ideas, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics all together in a single competent individual who's gonna go forward and accomplish great things. Watch now, watch this. This is something new that other freshmen aren't, you know, able to partake in. And, you know, it just makes you feel special at the same time. And the studies that we're doing in this program are going to be totally different from just a regular freshman class. And, and this is more geared to college level classes. So in the future, it'll make a real impact into our lives. So I'm really grateful that I'm in this program. <laughs> so here we go. Let's see what we've got. It is a lot of work. But it's kind of like, it, you kind of know that it's going to get you somewhere, so you're motivated to do it. I'm interested in the medical field, and I'm kind of trying to decide between being a doctor and a surgeon, but I don't really know where I want to go yet. All right, so you're pretty close. We have a great crisis coming in this country in the future and that we won't have enough scientists, especially in the computer science field we are going to have a huge deficit of people who can move us forward. And it's our job as educators to see that that doesn't happen. All right. That had showed up different when we were doing it. It said three and four for some reason. Oh, that's we interesting. Tried to, tried did you, did you note the one and the two? Did you click yeah. on the one? Okay. Well, okay. Was... well, let's see if we have it. Let's check. There's no sense walking away till we find out what we've got. Bam! Okay. How much do you love what you do? Yeah, I love what I do. It's, I, I, I have often said, both in front of my students and in front of their parents, sometimes I feel a little guilty when I get paid for what I do because it is a great gift. It truly is a gift. Um, everything is different every single day and almost every minute of every day because every personality that walks in my room is different. And so they all are having good days or bad days. They are doing well or not doing very well. I'm having a good day or a bad day. But we come together, and we come together for one reason, and it's chemistry. And while I know a lot of, a lot of people don't find chemistry to be the most exciting subject, I do. You do. I do. Because? Because I wonder at it all the time. I have never had to struggle so hard to understand anything as I do chemistry. And it's in the struggle and the success that I find so much amazement. It never ceases to give me a thrill. When something happens that's supposed to happen, something I could have predicted because of some kind of knowledge that I have, 
And when I can convey that to a learner, especially mm. a first-time learner, these STEM students are freshmen in they're, high school. They're in ninth grade. Ninth graders. Now, they're in the STEM, what's the STEM Academy that you're doing? The STEM Academy is a new program that we've started at, in Jackson. We have a cohort at Jackson Memorial High School as well as one at Jack Jackson Liberty High School. 25 students who were chosen, who applied, who had to take a test, who had to go through many, oh yeah, many rigors to get accepted into the program. And now they will move together through high school as they fulfill the requirements of a STEM background, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. What could happen for them? Uh, great question. That's an outstanding question. That may, maybe them? that's what makes me most excited because the sky is the limit. When they go off to college with the background they're going to have, any of these fields are available. And it's not just that they'll be a member of the field, they'll be a leader in the field. They will be making the kind of difference that this country needs somebody to make in the decades to come. And, and in education, we try really hard to meet the needs of all, all students. This meets the need of a special group of exceptional young people, young people that get science and want to use technology and mathematics to make it, to explain it, and to cause it to work for us. Beyond that, the STEM Academy is a trickle-down event to all of education, because when we raise the bar for these children, when we say what we've done before for freshmen and sophomore and juniors and seniors in these fields is just not enough anymore. Mm. We're going to do more. We're going to do it better. We're going to do it at a higher level. Every student who's in a program that isn't the STEM Academy but is aligned to those programs is going to benefit, because if we can do it here, well, then we can do it over here. So this has opened a door in Jackson that will never close again. It's a door for the education in these fields that is going to move forward. And our, we already have students from Jackson that make remarkable differences in the world. It is even going to be better in the future. But, but and I ask you this question. I asked you this. We, we had a caucus New Jersey panel with Ann and three colleagues, uh, three exceptional, four exceptional educators. And we had a great discussion. And I asked you this somewhat facetiously, but I'm going to ask you again. When I hear and see, you know what I'm going to ask you, and you don't want me to ask you, <laughs> but I will. Okay. When I hear and see the level of passion and enthusiasm, when everyone watches that videotape from Classroom Close-Up from the NJEA, and I see it in your eyes right now, and you told us in the other program that you're retiring in two years, I mean, everyone has their own reasons for doing I, I what they're a, doing. I have a responsibility as I plan for my future. You're at the top of your game. Right. And, and I have a responsibility. It's a good question that you ask. I have, beyond, besides teaching the STEM Academy, I've also taught our advanced placement chemistry in Jackson. And last year, we were able to bring a brand new teacher in, and I was able to mentor her in anticipation of a process that's changing. We have 88 students taking our advanced placement chemistry test mm. this year in one high school, at the Memorial High School. That's more than any high school, I'm pretty sure, in the world. That's a program. Are you saying this is succession planning? <laughs> is that what you're saying? I'm saying that, that n nothing, not a program, not education, can depend on one individual. What we need to do, those of us that are experienced and enthusiastic, and good at what we do, we need to convey that to our colleagues. It just so happens this teacher we brought in is a former student of mine. So, <laughs> so, uh, what, so. <laughs> what we need to do is. To <laughs> this is a rational. Okay, I got it. What we need to do as teachers it. is keep the process going, so that long after I'm gone, we still have a hundred students taking AP Chem, All and right. the STEM Academy is vibrant, and young people are becoming scientists and changing the future of America. Top of your game. You are the best <laughs> at what you do. And I said this to the group of teachers, I'll say this to you again. You honor your profession. I can't even imagine how many young people's lives you've impacted on such a deep, deep level. And for all the parents of children in public schools, we say thank you. I am appreciative, thank okay, you. And wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Stay with us, we'll be right back right after this. Thank you. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. 
Welcome, my good friend, uh, Rick Hofling, Vice President, Newark Hub, United Airlines. Good to see you, Rick. Nice to see you, Steve. I was out there with uh, Laura Van Bloom, our head of uh, social media, marketing, communications. You were taking us on a tour. I'm like, this is what they do out here? It blew us away. Amazing stuff. It's incredible. Describe that hub. How exciting. It's, it's an incredible place to work. I've worked there for 30 years. I have fun every day. We've got 13,000 employees there that have been really committed to making Newark grow. We've, I, I was at Newark when we had two gates uh, back in the day, 1985. How many now? 30 years later, we have about uh, 72. <laughs> and the role United plays there? Huge role. Uh, United Airlines uh, is really Newark Airport. We're about 74% of the air carrier operations there. Serve a lot of different destinations, about 150 with about 400 flights a day. And your role, describe your role. My, you have a little bit of pressure? Huh? A little bit of pressure? Uh, yeah, well, but that's <laughs> good. It, right? yeah, I know it's good, but I describe it's good it. good pressure. Um, it's really fun being the leader at that airport. Um, as I said, I grew up uh, you know, in Elizabeth at one point in my life. I, it's where I was born and raised, saw the airport outside the window, loved it. I still love it to this day. It's still fun. So the pressure is pressure that, but it's good pressure. It's What's pressure that job? makes it fun. The Everything's job got to work. The job is, uh, you know, there's 13,000 of us, right? And they represent so many different aspects of what we do to provide our service each and every day. And it's, it's really making sure that, that the team actually comes together cohesively to deliver a great product each and every day. Well, beyond that, one of the reasons we have you on is to talk about the Summer Assist Agent Program, which is exciting because it's really making a difference for a lot of kids. What is it? Absolutely. It's a program that we've had uh, for about 10 years now. And what it does, we offer a program uh, to... Uh, college-level kids uh, that are either born and raised in uh, uh, Elizabeth, Newark, or East Orange, or go to school in those areas. Uh, and what we do is we give them uh, an opportunity to come work at the airport and see all those uh, disciplines that I previously mentioned. They get to experience the very complex nature of what an airline brings, and they get to see all the disciplines uh, that an airline represents. And it gives them an opportunity to really see, experience that, learn a little bit as they go. And I think that provides a little bit uh, of an internship uh, capability for them that they can use as they continue their Where careers. Where did the idea even come up? For them? Who came up with this idea and, and how? You know, well, you know, we're part of the community. You know, like, as I said, there's lots of us uh, at United at Newark Airport. And we're just, we're just members of the community like everyone else. And so, you know, we want to give back. Um, like everybody else. And it's an opportunity to take kids that are looking for something to do, give them some insight in terms of what goes on at an airport and the complexity, and have them, let them have fun doing but, it. But Rick, I also know there are requirements. You, not just any kid could be in the program. And there are some requirements, right? Sure. Um, uh, first of all, they have to pass a security background check, right? Or we're very conscious of that. They also have to be in good standing with their schools. And as long as they have that and they come on board and they show an eagerness, um, uh, a desire, and willingness to work with customers and, and experience that level of, uh, you know, that different dimension that's a part of a uh, service-oriented industry. Mm -hmm. If they meet those requirements, well, we'd like to give them a shot. Give us an example of what a student who's accepted into the Summer Assist Agent Program, what could this young person actually see and experience? All sorts of very fun things. Uh, first of all, they, they learn what it's like to work. Right? And, and some of these folks uh, uh, absolutely have had that background and experience. But now they're seeing it at a corporate level. And what we do is not only just bring them in and show them uh, you know, the, the tasks that they'll be doing over the course of the summer, but we also involve them and get them to experience different aspects of the business. So we'll have speakers. They'll have some opportunity to spend time with leadership, see different aspects of the business. It's really a great program. And, and they, really, they really respond well to it. The room that... Uh the room that Laura and I were in, the, the big room where, I don't, what the heck is it called? The Liberty Conference Room? The, no, no, the big one where all the activities were going on, where you're making all the decisions. You could see all the planes. Oh, the tower. The, our, the, our, the, what we call our station operations center. <sighs> it blew me away because I was struck not only by the technology, but frankly, Rick, by the people, the collaboration, the teamwork, the leadership, the calm. All, everything that was going on there, did they get to see any of that? Yes, they do. Absolutely. We, we bring them up to the tower. Um, and matter of fact, we encourage all of our employees to come up to our tower to see that. Um, you know, we're a very inclusive uh, uh, company. We want to make sure that everybody gets to see different things and experience different things. And we, and we do those kind of things each and every day. A couple of questions before I let you out of here. Um, I'm curious about the question of security. You talked about it before. 
and I'm sure a lot of people have this on their mind as well, give people a sense of greater security so they understand it's just some of the things you can talk about on the air that you guys are doing to make us safer. Sure. Um, well, we take it very, very seriously, um, and it means a lot. It's probably the most important thing we focus on um, outside of just the customer experience. Um, it is something that every one of us pays close attention to. If, you'll, if you walk around the airport, you'll see employees looking around. They're not only looking around for opportunities um, to help customers along the path, but they're also keeping an eye on things. Every one of our employees is centered on looking at the right things um, at the right time and making sure they have a, a significant awareness of their surroundings. And that's how we pay attention. And we work very closely uh, with the uh, government services, the Maybe TSA. The agencies, the, by the way. The TSA, the Transportation Security Administration, Customs Border Patrol, the FAA, the Port Authority, the Port Authority Police, um, the Department of uh, Homeland Security Police. We work with a lot of different partners. And we have significant levels of security. It's not just what you see at the checkpoints. There's a lot of things behind the scenes that obviously I can't get into, but there's layers of security that protect our customers every day. Point being, if we don't see it, it doesn't mean it's not happening. That's exactly right. How much do you love what you do? I love what I do. I was born for this job. I love what I do. I love the employees. I love the customers. The experience that I've had over uh, th the last 30 years, I wouldn't trade for a minute. So you grow up in Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. In the you're, in, you're literally in the backyard of the airport, and now you're the guy running it. Yeah, not bad. Kid from Elizabeth makes good. <laughs> uh, Rick Huffling is the vice president of the Newark Hub at United Airlines. By the way, how many again? Uh, gates? Seventy-two. And when you when you started, how many? Two. Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> things have grown, and things are getting better here at Newark Airport. Newark Liberty International Airport. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by United Water, the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, Berkeley College, MagnaCare, University Hospital, Newark, New Jersey, and by Fedway Associates. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Each year, Americans fill 4 billion prescriptions, but as much as one third of that medication will never be used. Some of this waste ends up in the rivers, lakes, and streams that make up our drinking water supply. The United Water Foundation and the National Community Pharmacists Association have partnered to bring you a simple solution. Dispose your meds responsibly. Go to DisposeMyMeds.org to find a participating pharmacy and to learn more. A public service message from the United Water Foundation and NCPA.